So the passage is Mark 12, verses 28 to 34. Mark 12, 28 to 34. The most important commandment. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, The most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only God, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. The teacher of religious law replied, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying, There is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you so much, Freddie. Um, There is a great story in Jewish tradition about a Gentile who visited two famous rabbis who were teaching in the first century. Um, And he went to uh, one called Shammai, and he uh, said to him, I will convert to Judaism if you can tell me the whole Jewish law while I stand on one leg. And that rabbi who found that offensive got a piece of wood and whacked him around the head and and threw him out the house. So he went to a second rabbi, Rabbi Hillel, and said the same question to him. He said, I will convert to your religion if you can tell me the whole of the Jewish law while I stand on one leg. And Hillel said this. He said, what you yourself hate, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole law. The rest is commentary. Go and get learning. It's a crazy thought that Jesus may well have heard that story circulating around at the time. But my point is this, that there were lots of debates at the time uh, between a mix of sort of theologians and lawyers about... um, what were the weightier commandments in the law? And by this time, uh, in Jewish tradition, they had come down on uh, the number that there were 613 commandments in the Torah. Apparently, they reckoned that 365 of those told you what not to do. So that's one a day for each day in the year. Nice. Nice. That's not what not to do. And then there were 248 that told you what you should do. So 365 don'ts and 248 do's, which adds up to 316. But by that time, they had also got loads of oral traditions um, that, that had elucidated those laws, expanded on those laws. And there were thousands of those. And that is why there was a lot of current debate around which commandments were weightier, which were light and which were heavy. So it was a very current question that this scribe brought to Jesus. The other thing you probably need to know about the background of this amazing account in the Gospel of Mark is that this is placed in the last week of Jesus' life before his crucifixion. So it was something like the Wednesday when he goes to the cross on the Friday. And so the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the chief priests have all decided that, frankly, they need to be rid of this man, Jesus. And they try to ask him questions to trap him and trick him. But funnily enough, 
what they're doing has the reverse effect. And the Gospels tell us that the, the crowds were absolutely amazed and astonished at his answers to these questions. And even this scribe sounds sort of intrigued and fascinated uh, that Jesus has answered so well. So how does Jesus answer this scribe? What does God require of you? To love him. To love him is the answer that Jesus gives. And you may not recognize that passage, but everyone listening would have recognized what Jesus was saying because it was in the Jewish law. It goes back to something called the Shema, which is a prayer that, that, uh, that the Jews prayed daily and still do. So it was at the very heart of their life of prayer. It's called the Shema, which means hear, listen, pay attention. And if you look back with me, if you've got a Bible, look back to Deuteronomy 6, and you can see exactly where Jesus got this from. So Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And it goes on to say, these words which I am commanding you today, this is Moses, shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So way back, they were being exhorted to take these words, take this law, take the commands of God, and weave them into every aspect of their lives, weave them into their conversations, remind each other of them, find ways to remind themselves of these words, to bind them into their, into their homes. If, if anything, it justifies the Christian fridge magnet, does it not? <laughs> It's a great reminder still, I believe, that we should look for ways to get God's words into our daily lives. But the big point here is this first bit where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And don't make the mistake of thinking that's about three in one as in the Trinity, This is about the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. He is the one and only. There is no one and nothing besides him. He has no equal, no rival, no parallel, no opposite. We're in a context here where people may well be saying, yes, I love this God, but I also love this God and this God and this God. So this was radical in the context. No, no, there is no God besides this God. He stands unrivaled. He stands as one. Consequently, your love for him is to be undivided. This is a faithful, exclusive, and forever relationship. Because he is one, he will not share his love. And he requires all of our love. Love him with our hearts, our souls, our minds, our strength. In a nutshell, love him with everything that you've got, everything that you are. But pause to think about those things too. God has made you an intelligent, emotional, willful, and physical being. 
love God with all of that. We have little phrases, don't we, like wholehearted or single-minded. This is a whole life love. What does it look like to love God with your intellect, to love God with your brain, <laughs> to love God with your thoughts? What does it look like to love God with your feelings, your passions? What does it look like to love God with your intentions, your choices? What does it look like to love God with your body, with your actions? This is clearly big. This is the foremost commandment. So I want to say a tiny bit about why. If you're looking to love God with your whole life, with your whole being, with every aspect of who you are, why? <laughs> and then how? Many of you will know Tom Wright, who always writes brilliantly on the Gospels and many other things. But he said this in his commentary on this little passage. He said, if it's true that we are made in God's image, we will find our fullest meaning and our true selves the more we learn to love and worship the one we are designed to reflect. I'll read that again. If it's true that we are made in God's image, we will find our fullest meaning and our true selves the more we learn to love and worship the one we are designed to reflect. I don't know if you could catch that, but what it means is that the reason why you love God the reason why that is what your life is about, the reason why that is who you are designed to be means that your purpose and your identity are sorted, basically, as you love God and love him more. You are designed to love God. You are designed to know who you are and what your life is all about as you love God. So how? How will we love God? I want to give a shout out to feelings. Because we often hear talks nowadays about how we are living our lives totally depending on our feelings and how that needs to stop. So I want to just say this. I think you do need to love God with your feelings. If you look at through the Bible, you see stuff like um, this invitation to gaze on God's beauty. To gaze on God's beauty. To wonder at his creation. To weep at what he's done for you. To be in awe at his power and his majesty, even St. Paul, in writing some of those letters to the churches, is basically speechless because he cannot find the words to say how amazing God is. And in the 17th century, believe it or not, there was what they called a shorter Westminster Catechism, which was a teaching document, I think, aimed at children. But it said this, it answered the question, what is the chief end of man? And the answer was, I'm sure some of you will know this, to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. Enjoy God. When was the last time you enjoyed God? You get to be intimate with God. You get to be intimate with God Almighty. And if that doesn't precipitate or stir up some feelings in us, then I don't know what will. <laughs> we long for God, says the psalmist. I delight in your law. Your love for God doesn't depend on feelings, 
But I believe you, you can and should love God and train yourself to love God with your emotions. Maybe that's something you would like to think more about or disagree with. <laughs> now, we can only scratch the surface about how we might love God, but I've picked out a couple of other things to think about. One is our choices. We, particularly in this culture, are almost overwhelmed by our choices. But you make choices every moment of every day, and those depend at least partly on what you treasure, what you choose, what you prioritize. And you know, um, John, who I'm married to, went shopping yesterday for some food, and he, I, I knew marmalade was on the list. But he came back with fine cut marmalade. And that will probably mean nothing to you. But he doesn't like fine cut marmalade. He likes thick cut marmalade. The point is, he knows I like thin cut marmalade. What a saint. He made a choice to show a bit of love to me and to prefer me over him. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> But what about, what about the choices we make to show God that we love him? What choices are we making with our time, with our money? Those two things seem to me like powerful gifts. And yes, they are gifts. You get to offer them as you make your choices. You make them an offering back to God. Loving God is about choosing. Loving God is about trusting. Trusting him with things that matter to you. Trusting him in the decisions that you need to make. And loving God is about obeying him. It's about finding out what God wants and living in response to that. It's about knowing the scriptures enough to wonder about what that might look like as you make these decisions and choices in your life. Now, for example, down to buying loo roll. You look across the loo rolls and you think, will I buy one that feels like a cloud on my bottom? (laughs) Or will I just buy the cheapest one because I am saving my money up? Or will I buy the one that does least damage to the planet? There are so many ways that we can live loving God. Live in a way that pleases him. And we need to probably help each other to work out what that might look like in our lives. And loving God is serving God in the world. You might be an excellent engineer. That is an expression of your love to God. You might be a brilliant and honest accountant. That is your expression of love to God. You might be a patient carer. That is an expression of your love for God. What In in what you do, are you glorifying God? Is it a sweet offering, if you like, back to him? Because what you're good at is a gift that he has first given to you. So how can we love God more? There was a poet in the 18th century called William Cowper, and he wrote a poem, and the last verse says this. It says, Lord, it is my chief complaint that my love is weak and faint, yet I love thee and adore, oh, for grace to love thee more. (laughs) I like that. Lord, it is my chief complaint that my love is weak weak and faint, but lots of us (laughs) recognize that sentiment and we long to love God more. 
So we need to ask ourselves one question, and that is, what do we do with the things in our lives that dilute and diminish our love for God? Now, to be fair, when Jesus answers this question from the scribe, he chooses a a positive spin on this question. When you think about Exodus 20 and those commandments, the Ten Commandments first given to the people of God, you, you got the first commandment, which is, you shall have no other gods. But down the line and over time and passing through that Shema, love God with everything you've got, Jesus does ask you to love him, to love him with all of your heart, with everything that you are. So how are we going to get rid of stuff that hinders that and pushes its way in on that? The best way to stop doing something, I think, is often to start doing something better. I don't know if any of you saw the film A Beautiful Mind. I think it was 2001, possibly. Um, but it is, um, it, is, it is about this brilliant man who is plagued by destructive and deceptive delusions. And at the end of the film, his friend says to him, are they gone? And he says, no, but I've got used to ignoring them. And as a result, they've kind of given up on me. You've got to keep feeding them for them to stay alive. You've got to keep feeding them for them to stay alive. And I think it's the same with some of these things that are muscling in on God's place in our lives. The Bible says, set your minds on things above. It says, clothe yourself with kindness and compassion. Gaze on God's beauty. Remember Jesus. So do more of the things you love that honor and delight God. Don't give oxygen, so to speak. Don't feed those things that um, pull you away from loving God. And briefly, we probably need to think about the things uh, that we need to ruthlessly cut out of our lives. Things where there's nothing good about them. There are some things that push in on our love for God, which aren't bad things in themselves. But there are some things where there's nothing good. There's nothing good about them. And I was reading statistics recently about pornography and about how younger and younger children are being exposed to pornography. And a mum was telling me a couple of weeks ago that her, her child, 10 years old, was on the computer playing a game. And then suddenly this advert drops in on the right-hand side and it says, click here to see Barbara's titties. And I must admit, when she told me that, I laughed. I, I couldn't help it. I snorted with laughter and I sort of felt for a moment a slight curiosity to think, golly, I wonder what they looked like. <laughs> But then, as I thought about it a little bit more, and as I thought about saying something today, the thing is, I mean, this prayer saying, hear, oh Israel, pay attention, wake up people, listen up, love the Lord your God with all of you. Because what happens, whether you're 10 or whether you're 55, is that you get a little window of opportunity. You get a little window, (laughs) an invitation into something that you know really is not what loving God looks like. And, And you climb through that little window and then you find you can't get out, that you're trapped. And you get into something that's destructive and it leads you into guilt and shame and addiction and deception. So that stuff, we just need to gouge it out. We need to get rid of it, cut, cut it out of your life. And then there are other things that are good things, but they sometimes get in the wrong place in our lives. For me, that could be red wine. It could be even, and the Bible talks about this, it could be even your love for your own children. All kinds of things can begin to push 
God out of the place that only he can take in your life. There's only room for one (laughs) where God is. (laughs) So get those around you to help you to see where you need to make an adjustment. Whether it's something that you need to be brutal and ruthless about, or whether it just needs a little refreshing um, in your love for God, and something just needs to be moved to one side. Finally, one final story. I have a friend in Bristol who had a guitar that he very much loved. He played it a lot. He played it um, at his church as part of worship. And he was carrying it on his back one day through the city of Bristol. And he, he came across, he was just passing two guys who were living on the street. And he felt the Holy Spirit nudge him and say, I want you to give your guitar to that man there. But he couldn't do it. He walked on by because his guitar was so precious to him and he paid a lot for it (laughs) and he loved it and he used it and he worshipped God with it. So he went on by. But that night and the following morning, he was reminded in a most peculiar way, in fact, of the fact that God had asked him to give his guitar away. So he said to God, oh, fine, you know, I'll go back in the morning and if those two blokes are there in the same spot, I will give my guitar away. So the next morning he set off with his guitar and Sadly for him, I feel, he saw the same two blokes the next morning in the same spot. And so um, he gave his guitar away. A few days later, he was walking along and he passed a a shop window where they sold secondhand instruments. And guess what? His guitar was sitting in the shop window for sale. This guy had uh, sold it for drugs, for drugs money. So he went into the shop and he said, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, it's all a mistake. That's my guitar. Um, But the shopkeeper, I don't know, didn't feel moved by his story and said, I'm afraid you'll have to pay for it if you want it. So um, he reduced the price a little bit. And our friend um, found that money and paid for the guitar again. (laughs) He bought it back. Now, the reason I tell you that story as we end is, one, because I think it's a great story of how we, we open up our daily lives to listening to what God is telling us to do. And sometimes we mess it up, but that's what love looks like, isn't it? Being willing to let go of something you treasure because you treasure him even more. That's a tiny glimpse of what loving God looks like. But this story came to mind for another reason. And that reason was because in that story, he pays for that guitar twice. He bought back what was already his. And that is what God does for us. That is how God shows us his love. And we can only love God as much as we understand and receive and live out of the love that he has shown to us. The Bible says this is love. That God gave himself in his son Jesus. Who he sent into the world. He gave for us, paying a price for our wholeness so that he, so that we might come alive through him. God designed us. He made us. Somewhere along the line, we got estranged and he bought us back. He bought back what what was already his. This is love. And it's a faithful love. It's a lavish love. It's a never-ending love. It's a self-emptying love. So we've got a bit of time now to...